Hi, I'm John McCloskey. In this video series, we will be talking about the fundamentals of electromagnetics. While I do not intend to replace any university level coursework on this subject, I do intend to give you a practical understanding of the basic principles so that you can apply them to your daily work right away. And if you work with electronics in any capacity, you really need to have a working knowledge of these principles. I will be throwing some theory and some math at you, but fear not, I will also provide a lot of real world examples and demonstrations to help drive the points home. We will start with electric fields and how they relate to two concepts you should already be familiar with, potential and capacitance. And right from the start, we will dispense with any of this nonsense about electromagnetics having anything to do with black magic. No pointed wizard hats, no magic wands, or any of that. It all just comes down to the laws of physics. And like with a lot of things in physics, it starts with forces. An isolated charge in space exerts a force on an external charge in its vicinity. The electric field is defined simply as the force per unit charge, and it is expressed in units of newtons per coulomb. While those units are good for describing the interactions at the charged particle level, some alternate units are more helpful for describing the interactions on a larger scale, such as with electronic circuits. If we multiply top and bottom by meters, we have newton meters per coulomb meter. A newton meter is the definition of a joule the unit of work or energy. Now we have a joule per coulomb meter. A joule per coulomb is the very definition of a volt, the unit of electric potential. Now we have volts per meter, which facilitates a more intuitive understanding of electric field and how to apply it. If we take a pair of parallel conducting plates separated by a distance d and place a potential v across them, we have created an electric field between the plates with a magnitude of V over D. If we place one volt across one meter, we have created an electric field of one volt per meter. The electric field is the same if we place 10 millivolts across a centimeter or one millivolt across a millimeter, as long as the V over D ratio stays the same. A more general definition of electric field is that it is the negative gradient of potential or that potential is equal to the negative of the line integral of electric field along a contour, in this case, the space between the plates. The significance of the negative sign is that the electric field vector points in the opposite direction of the applied potential. When we apply a potential across two conductors, charge collects on each surface. Capacitance is defined as the charge divided by the applied potential, and it's in units of farads. It is important to understand that when you apply a potential across a pair of conductors, you will have capacitance whether or not it appears on your schematic. If these conductors are not in direct physical contact, they are separated by a dielectric with some permittivity designated by the Greek letter epsilon. For our pair of parallel plates separated by distance d and each plate having a surface area a, the capacitance is expressed by the familiar equation epsilon a over d. So what of this term epsilon, this permittivity? It's an inherent material property that is clearly related to capacitance. We'll come back to it in just a moment, but first it's helpful to consider the example of another familiar material property. While we designate a resistor on our schematics with this familiar symbol, a physical resistor is made of some material with bulk resistivity designated by the Greek letter rho. It only becomes a physical resistor when it is formed into some defined shape with length L and cross-sectional area A. It makes intuitive sense that if the length increases, the resistance will go up, and if the cross-sectional area increases, the resistance will go down. Thus, the resistance of the shape equals L over A multiplied by the resistivity. With L in units of meters and A in square meters, and in order to end up with a resistance in ohms, the units of rho must be ohm meters. This looks a little strange on its own, but remember that these units only take on physical meaning when a specific shape is formed out of the bulk material. 
Sometimes this material property is expressed as the reciprocal of resistivity, called the conductivity, designated by the Greek letter sigma, expressed in units of inverse ohms per meter. Inverse ohms is sometimes shown as an upside-down ohm symbol, also known as Mohs or Siemens. It's all the same material property, just expressed in different ways. While resistivity expresses the inherent capability of a material to be resistive, permittivity expresses the inherent capability of a material to be capacitive. For that reason, I like to think of it informally as capacitivity to provide a more intuitive understanding of what it means. The term epsilon is the product of the relative permittivity, epsilon r, and the permittivity of free space, epsilon zero or epsilon naught. Epsilon naught equals one over 36 pi times 10 to the minus nine farads per meter, or approximately 8.84 picofarads per meter. These numbers are worth committing to memory because we'll be using them all the time. Farads are the units of capacitance, but just as with resistivity or conductivity, the per meter portion takes on physical meaning only when a specific shape is formed around the dielectric. The relative permittivity is a dimensionless constant for a given material, and it is also known as the dielectric constant. By definition, the dielectric constant of free space, or vacuum, is 1. The dielectric constant of air is slightly higher than 1, but we generally take it to be equal to 1 for all practical purposes. And because a lot of coupling occurs through air, we will be using this one quite a lot. Ceramic dielectrics used in intentional capacitors have typical constants in the range of 5 to 10, and tantalum oxide has a constant of approximately 27. Dielectric constants of materials are generally available online or on material data sheets, but a couple more worth noting here are Teflon, typically used as wire insulation, with a constant of around 2, and G10 fiberglass used to make printed circuit boards with a constant of approximately 5. This constant is multiplied by epsilon naught to get the total permittivity, or capacitivity, of the dielectric. Just as with resistivity, it must be formed into some physical shape in order to have capacitance. Remember that a capacitor is formed by applying a potential between a pair of conductors, and the shape is defined by this pair of conductors surrounding the dielectric between them. As we have already seen for our example of parallel plates with surface area A and separation D, the capacitance is epsilon A over D. With A in square meters and D in meters, the units work out to give capacitance in farads. The parallel plate is a simple structure and gives a simple equation for capacitance. We will eventually look at more complex structures, and of course the math will get a bit more complex as well. But the general principle will always hold true that the capacitance is a function of the size of the conductors, the separation between them, and the permittivity or capacitivity of the dielectric. Up to now, we've been considering only a static or DC potential across our parallel plates. Things get a lot more interesting when we apply a time varying or AC potential. Rearranging the terms of our capacitance equation, we see that a time varying potential will cause the charge distribution to also vary over time, giving rise to a displacement current through the dielectric. If we look at the frequency domain representation of the applied potential, we see that the displacement current is also a function of frequency. Dividing potential by the displacement current gives the impedance, or the capacitive reactance designated by X sub C, and given by the familiar expression 1 over J omega C, or 1 over 2 pi F C. Thus, the capacitive reactance decreases with increasing frequency, allowing more displacement current to flow where there is no conductive connection, and quite possibly into neighboring circuits where they might cause some disruptions. So now, after all that theory, 
it's time to show you a bit of capacitive coupling in action using this simple fixture consisting of a couple of wires above a ground plane. What we have here is a signal generator connected through this BNC cable to a BNC feed through on this L bracket, which connects to this red wire, which I'm going to call our culprit wire. Also sometimes called an aggressor. Then there's a second wire, the orange wire, which we will call our victim wire that is just open circuited on this end. It has all, it's also connected to a BNC feed through, but I have it open circuited on this end for reasons that will become clear presently. Then the two wires run across the fixture, connected to the other side, connected to the BNC feed throughs on the other side. And our culprit wire runs to the channel one on our oscilloscope and the victim wire runs to channel two. I have the pair of wires run very close together. I have some Velcro straps here, tying them as closely as possible together to maximize the capacitive coupling. There is no conductive connection between the wires. The only physical contact is through the insulation. So it's all capacitive coupling, as we will see. There is no conductive connection between the wires. And coming back to the input side, I have left the input side of the uh, victim wire open circuited so that there is no conductive path on that side. The, the only way for current to flow in the victim circuit is through the capacitance between our culprit and our victim. And that is exactly what we are going to demonstrate. The circuit is a simple impedance divider between the 50 ohm input of the scope and the capacitance between the wires, which we will estimate to be approximately 20 picofarads. In the next session, I will show you how to calculate the capacitance of different configurations and specifically where this 20 picofarad number comes from. The applied potential to our culprit wire will be a constant level of 10 volts peak to peak. Starting at a frequency of 10 kilohertz, the capacitive reactance will be about 800 kilohms, which is four orders of magnitude higher than the 50 ohm input impedance of the scope. We expect that to produce a coupled potential on the victim wire on the order of 0.6 millivolts, which we should just barely be able to see above the scope's noise floor. The top yellow trace is the potential on our culprit wire, showing a nice beefy level of 10 volts peak to peak. The bottom blue trace is the coupled potential on our victim wire. We're at a frequency of 10 kilohertz, and with our vertical scale at the minimum setting of one millivolt per division, we can just barely make out a level of about half a millivolt peak to peak, which is right in line with what we expected. Now, let's increase the frequency by a factor of 10 to 100 kilohertz, and change the vertical scale to 5 millivolts per division. The coupled potential has also increased by about a factor of 10 to about 5 millivolts peak to peak, as expected, because the capacitive reactance dividing with the 50 ohm scope input has gone down by a factor of 10. Now, let's take the frequency up another factor of 10 to 1 megahertz and change the vertical scale to 50 millivolts per division. The coupled potential has increased by another factor of 10 to about 50 millivolts peak to peak, again as expected. Another thing that is worth noting is that the victim trace leads the culprit trace by about 90 degrees. This makes sense because the victim potential is caused by the displacement current in the capacitance, which is in turn caused by the changing potential on the culprit. In any capacitance or capacitor, the voltage will lag the current, or the current will lead the voltage by 90 degrees. So does this amount of coupling pose a problem on the order of 50 millivolts? Well, that always depends on the sensitivity of your victim circuit. If it's a power line where you can tolerate hundreds of millivolts of noise, then you probably don't care. But if it's a low level analog telemetry signal where you're trying to sense less than a millivolt, then you probably do care very much.
Now you might also be saying, well, I'm a digital logic designer, so I really don't care about this. I just deal with ones and zeros and I have all the noise immunity in the world. Well, okay, let's look at that a little more closely. If we go from a sine wave on our signal generator to a square wave, well, look at that. That doesn't look very pretty at all. In fact, I need to, need to reduce the sensitivity a little bit here to be able to, to see it. So now our vertical scale is at 500 millivolts per division. So we're seeing about half a volt of coupling on each one of those edges. So remember, it's, it's the change over time that really gets you. You're not really seeing any coupling over the plateaus because nothing is changing there. It's at the edges that you have very significant coupling. And so half a volt of coupling onto a digital logic line may be quite significant, especially if that's a clock line and you're experiencing those kinds of glitches on a regular basis on a clock line, that's something that can totally freeze up a state machine. So in some ways, this kind of coupling in a digital circuit can be much worse than it can be in an analog circuit. Because with an analog circuit, you have some chance of graceful degradation that your circuit may be compromised, but it still basically works. But in a digital system, this type of noise could completely freeze up your circuit. So the ramifications could be a lot worse. Moreover, in a digital system, you could be dealing with rise and fall times that are very fast, which is where your problems are going to occur. So you could have transitions that are much faster than anything you might experience in an analog circuit. After we talk about magnetic fields and magnetic coupling, we'll start discussing mitigation strategies. But for the moment, I just wanted to show you this simple demonstration of capacitive coupling to raise your awareness of it, because it will bite you one day if you're not paying attention. So there's your introduction to electric fields and how they relate to potential and capacitance. In the next session, we'll take a look at Gauss's law and how to apply it to calculate the capacitance of different configurations, including the parallel wires we used in our capacitive coupling demonstration. See you next time.